we continue with Tripura Rahasya chapter 6, the doubts of Hema Chuda and the teaching of Hema Lekha on firm faith. In the last chapter, Hema Lekha narrated this story, which is very symbolic and allegorical story with great deal of meaning, very deep, and um, most of us had difficulties understanding it. That's totally fine because in the following chapters she does explain also what it means. And now we begin chapter 6. Hearing his beloved wife speak, Prince Hemachuda was astonished and still unsure. He did not know that she was an enlightened being. Smiling, he asked her, Sweetheart, everything you say seems to be like building a mansion on sand. Your speech and facts do not match. You are the daughter of a celestial nymph and were brought up by a rishi. You have just recently reached your adulthood, but the events you are describing would take generations to occur. You talk like a woman possessed by spirits. There is no consistency in your story. What can I possibly make of it? Tell me, where is this maidservant of yours? And the son who captivated her? Tell me where that city is. Oh, forget all this and just tell me, where is that maidservant? I did not meet any maid. Your mother is in the palace. My mother is in the palace. Go ask her. My father has only one wife. Tell me immediately where such a maid is to be found and where her son is. You are talking in parables like that of a barren woman who claims to have a son. Your story reminds me of the comedian in a drama who claimed my barren, a barren woman's son is riding a chariot reflected in a mirror. He is wearing silver ornaments made from the shiny surface of a shell. He killed a shiny inner surface of a shell. He killed a king who had not yet been born with weapons made from human horns while fighting in a forest in the sky. He also conquered the mythical city of the Gandharvas and is enjoying dream women from the dream city. Your story makes as much sense as this one. Hearing him, that brilliant woman spoke again. <clears throat> so now we see that the prince is referring to this story, parable told by Hemalekha, his wife, and it is very clear that he has not understood that this is not a real story. It's just not a narration of her life. It is symbolic and has great meaning, deeper meaning. Now, this is something which has been happening since millennia. Really, thousands of years, people have misunderstood parables, have misunderstood mythologies, taking it to be real. All the mythologies throughout the world, whether they are Hindu mythologies, Greek, Roman, Scandinavian, all these stories are symbolic. If we talk about Hindu mythology and we refer to Shiva, Ganesh, all these gods. There are people who genuinely believe that there's someone with blue skin and there's somebody with an elephant's head somewhere in heaven up in the sky. And these people also get angry when, they, when you challenge this. And if you challenge it, they say you're an atheist. But this is not the god we are referring to. Also in other traditions of the world, spiritual traditions, for example, the Christian tradition, Jesus spoke in parables. People did not understand him. 
or there have been great saints, sages, who, for example, said, I am God. People did not understand that such a person is not a heretic, but he is referring simply to the fact that as an enlightened being, he identifies with pure consciousness, which is the divine in us. So we say in our tradition, in the yogic tradition, we don't talk about God, we talk about the divine, the divine part in you, the godly part in you, yourself. So also all these stories, which are spiritual stories throughout the world, have often been misunderstood by people. They make fun of it. For example, the Bhagavad Gita is narrated on the battlefield between two armies. And Krishna and Arjun go out in the center of the battlefield and they're having this discussion. And people make fun of it and say, how is it possible for them to go in the middle of a battlefield and have such a long discussion? It is symbolic. They're referring to the aspects of the mind that are battling between each other. So also the story told by Himalekha is symbolic, but was not understood by the prince. So he challenges her. He even treats her a little bit in this condescending manner and says, oh, sweetheart, you know, everything you say is like building a mansion on sand. And that is exactly what happens when ignorant people do not understand such deep, meaningful, symbolic stories. They make fun of these rich spiritual traditions. They laugh at uh, stories from the Bhagavad Gita and say, oh, it's, it's silly. How, how, can, how can they talk there in the middle of a battlefield? So, the prince makes fun of her and says that your story is as foolish as the claim of a woman, a barren woman who claims to have a son. Or he narrates this small short story where he says that a barren woman's son is wearing a silver ornament made from the inner surface of a shell. And he killed a king who was not born with weapons made from human horns. Obviously, humans don't have horns. So, such absurdities. And he says, basically, your story is absurd. Not having understood it at all. And this is exactly what people who do not understand Due to a lack of direct experience, they make fun of these symbolic tales that are taught in this manner so that they go deeper into the unconscious mind. They appeal to the unconscious mind because of the symbolic nature, because of these wonderful visuals which... It appealed to the unconscious mind. For example, when we talk about a barren woman's son, you immediately understand that's not possible, that's impossible. Or when you talk about killing a king who has not been born, is absurd. So this appeals to the unconscious mind. And that's why Tripura Rasya, full of such metaphors full of very symbolic stories appears to the unconscious mind. So those of you who do have this as a book should read it again and again. A very nice time to read it is before bedtime. It really goes into the unconscious mind and the mind plays with it, plays with these images. And it's a, a wonderful way of getting spiritual insights. Almost all teachings in the 
Indian tradition has been in story form. And the reason for that is that stories, especially such stories, appeal to a deeper part of the mind. So you don't just understand at a conscious level, but an unconscious level. And we know that the, it is the unconscious level of the mind that really is the more important aspect. It's like an iceberg. The iceberg floating there in the sea, you only see a small part of it. But the major part of the iceberg is underwater, is unseen. And so also, <clears throat> all these stories appeal to that part of the mind which is not seen, which is in fact the part that influences us in every aspect of our life. Any questions, comments about this? Before I continue with Himalekha's response. In the meantime, a couple of other people joined in. This is very nice. Hello, Stephanie, Judy, Shibu, Manisha, hi. Okay. Balaji. Good. <clears throat> so, I continue with verse... 13, Himalekha says, Lord, how can the things I have told you be false? My parables are not false. Speaking untruth destroys the austerities. How can one see beauty in leprosy? And how can one born in a family of truthful people tell lies? The man who diverts the mind of a seeker by lying can never attain happiness in this world or the next. Very briefly here, I'd like to add, the, ma the man who diverts the mind of a seeker by lying can never attain happiness. This is a direct reference to teachers who are not authentic, who are false teachers and they are misleading, misguiding sincere students. And also referring to those people who have attained something, if they would mislead somebody, they would be, uh, be gathering demerit or or bad karma basically so obviously she says i'm not lying i'm not telling untruth because this if i would do that would come back to me so she continues emalaika says oh prince hear me attentively one with defective eyesight cannot regain his eyesight by merely pronouncing the words of the remedy. An ignorant person considers helpful advice to be worthless. How can I, your beloved wife, lead you, who sincerely wants to find the truth to the unreal? Even if my statements are utterly contradictory, you can understand them through the help of your subtle and discriminating intellect. People are accustomed to making judgments in their daily activities. By examining a few details, they understand the whole situation. To help you think clearly about this, let me remind you of one of your own experiences. After having listened to me the other day, why are the objects that previously provided pleasure unpleasant to you now? They still provide pleasure to others. Now you can determine the validity of my story. Short comment about this. 
This particular line says those who have a defective eyesight cannot regain their eyesight just by pronouncing the names of the remedy. So obviously how do you get cured? <clears throat> you need to take the remedy. You have to eat or drink the medicine. So an ignorant person may not take the advice of somebody who is really authentic or genuine. He will ignore this good advice. But she says being his wife, she would not lead him to the unreal. So she asks him now to think carefully about what she said, what he understood and what he did. To contemplate a little bit further. And she explains further on this subject. She says, O oh Prince, I am telling you the truth. Please listen to it humbly. Not trusting a trustworthy person makes one his own worst enemy. This is a very important comment. Very often we ignore the advice of people whom we know to be trustworthy simply because it does not fit in with what we want to do, what we have made up our minds to do or what we have somehow got attached to, certain idea or certain things. And though we know that the person is trustworthy, person has some wisdom, some experience, we still ignore that. For example, this is done very often by children, teenage, teenagers especially. They ignore the advice or the guidance of their parents who have more experience, who have greater understanding and they don't trust them anymore, which is very unfortunate. And this creates a lot of problems for such young people. When we become adults, of course, we don't want to hear any advice from anybody because we think we are grown up and therefore don't need any more advice. But fact is that even though many of us as adults do not have that expanded consciousness or awareness and therefore are not able to make really good judgments at times. And we mistake the good or the pleasurable for the good. And we know actually that which is pleasurable is not necessarily good for us. Himalekha continues. Firm faith is a mother. She protects those who take refuge in her. As a compassionate mother protects her own children in all difficulties. That fool who does not have firm faith in the teachings of the self-realized one once loses wealth, happiness and reputation. A person without firm faith remains ignorant. It is firm conviction that sustains the whole and it is a life fall. Tell me, how could a child survive without having full faith in his mother? Short comment here. The example of mother is given. It's very important because a mother will protect her child in all difficulties the best she can do. And it also refers to the self-realized one. If you do not have faith in these teachings, you will lose what you have because if you do not take that guidance, you don't accept that guidance, you will make mistakes. You will harm yourself. So such a person becomes his own worst enemy. He 
Hey, Malika continues. How can a young man be happy if he does not trust his wife? How can an old man rest peacefully if he has no confidence in the younger generation? How can a farmer till his field if he does not believe in the harvest? Without faith and trust, no one will bother to either collect or renounce the things of the world. Without trust and truth, the world will crumble. If you say the world functions without faith, that is not true. Predicting future events on the basis of past experience requires faith in the causal relationship between past and future. Without faith, faith no one can even breathe. So cultivate firm faith and use it to attain sublime happiness. If you think one should not rely on stupid people, then listen. This thought is based on faith in their unreliability. After hearing her brilliant sermon, the prince asked to comment shortly on this. She is referring now to the idea of faith. Faith, trust, conviction, these are things that all successful people know and understand. Without having firm conviction, you cannot achieve anything in life. If you have done anything successfully in your life, you know it is because you had firm faith in something. If someone started, you know, um, on a certain path, whether it is an education, starting to study something, you had firm faith that you would do well, you would pass, and you would get a degree. If you did not believe that you, you are un, if you believe that you are not able to do something, if you have no belief in that, you cannot succeed. And at the same time, she explains, even if you do not believe in something, that itself is again faith. Is the faith in, in your lack of belief in yourself. Just as somebody is not punctual, is unreliable, then after a while, I have, I have firm faith in that person's unreliability. So that also is based on faith. So everything we do is based on our conviction. We do so many things assuming certain things are going to happen. All of us go to bed at night with the firm conviction we're going to wake up in the morning. We go to bed at night or we watch a sunset with the firm conviction that it's going to rise tomorrow morning. And we plan our life accordingly. We plan our life years ahead. For example, when you study or you take a job or for those who are getting, who are adults and they're planning for their future, for retirement, <clears throat> We plan years and years ahead. So we have faith in something. And without this faith, you cannot succeed in anything. Any questions so far on the topic of faith? Having heard her sermon, the prince asked, Hey Malekha, according to you, faith is necessary for spiritual growth. You say that I must develop faith in wise people so that I can attain the state of auspiciousness. One who wants to attain the highest good should not trust the wicked or he will be victimized. Those who seem good on the surface may be crooked inside and may deceive us like the fish who becomes the victim of an alluring worm wrapped around a fisherman's hook. Therefore, one should discriminate between the wise and the honest, the wicked and the deceitful. There are many examples of those who created problems for themselves by trusting someone unwise and those who got out of difficulties by having faith in the wise. But the question is, how can, 
how can you be certain your judgment about whether people are wise or wicked is correct? Your judgment itself requires scrutiny. A very valid question by Hema Chuda. He is like all modern students, skeptical, has many questions, has doubts and naturally a very valid question. How can I be sure that this person who I think is wise is really wise? How do I know whether he is wicked or wise? Being challenged in this manner, Himalekha answered her husband, O oh, Prince, listen to me. First decide whether a man is good or bad. Even if you have arrived at that conclusion by having firm faith in great men, this conclusion is still subject to confirmation by the signs and symptoms we see in them. Thus, firm faith will be subverted by reliance on signs and symptoms as explained in the scriptures. If you say that the characteristics of a good man are described in the scriptures, then I ask, how can you believe the scriptures if you have no faith? If, on the other hand, you do not trust the scriptures, but you accept the reliability of people's statements, then the advice of a human being will be your basis for believing or not believing in something. However, the statements of all humans are not unanimous. Therefore, people should have firm conviction, but the validity of that conviction must be confirmed by the scriptures. I am explaining to you the means of attaining the highest goal of life. Please listen attentively. Neither those who involve themselves in mere logic, nor those who do not, un do not reason at all, can attain the goal here and hereafter. Long ago, in the direction of Saya mountain, there was a sage called Kaushika living at the bank of the Godavari river. He was very learned. There were hundreds of students under his guidance. One day, in the absence of the master, those students began arguing about the nature of the universe according to their intellectual knowledge. During that time, a highly educated Brahmin named Sunga arrived. He used his mental skills and defeated all of them in debate. Lacking faith in the scriptures, that Brahmin had lost his intuitive wisdom. However, he was an adept debater with great power of discussion. The students all agreed that whatever can be elaborated through evidence must be true. Then Sunga said, Brahmins, listen, you claim that whatever can be proved through evidence must be considered true. But in this way, truth can never be proven. Because if the evidence is inconclusive, the conclusion derived from it will be faulty too. Therefore, first one must evaluate the evidence. The evidence has to be validated through some other proof. In order to determine the faultlessness of that new proof, one must depend on still other evidence. Thus a logician falls into the fallacy of infinite regression and nothing at all can be directly shown to be true. Therefore the thinker, the object and the source or the means of knowledge can never be proven. The conclusion we come to is shunya, the void. Yet the void cannot be proven without reliable evidence. Trying to prove the void ends in void. Impressed by these arguments of Shunga, the students with shallow knowledge followed him accepting Shunyavad, the philosophy of the void. Because of their confidence in Shunga, they got lost in the jungle of this philosophy and ruined their lives. But there were a few discriminating students who presented the views of Shunga to their learned master and received a proper answer, which dispelled their doubts. Therefore, only one who abandons Mere logic and who reasons with the assistance of genuine scriptures attains the higher state. This is an important story. We need to understand the background from which it comes. It was historically 
very common during these times in India, that part which is known as India today and also parts of Nepal, Pakistan, that there were a lot of debates between people following different teachers, lineages, following different scriptures or schools such as Tantra, Advaita, Yoga, Sankhya. One other school which came up and became very strong was the school of Shunyavada. Shunyavada is the void. Vada is school. So it's the school of the void. Does that sound familiar to some of you? It is what is today called Buddhism. In those days, it was a part of the Hindu stream. Hindu tradition. It was a sect or a community within the larger Hindu spiritual landscape. It became very dominant and powerful during the reign of King Ashoka who adopted this as his way of life, promoted it until it was and being the emperor, being very rich, he put in a lot of wealth behind it. And there were a lot of conversions to this system or school of, of philosophy. And Shunyavad was also then, through missionaries, taken abroad to what is today Thailand, Burma, or Myanmar, Cambodia, Sri Lanka, China, and many other countries. Now, Shunyavad, the basic idea is that there is nothing, there is no real foundation. So, they did not speak about Atman, pure consciousness, or God. They said there is a void. And this was considered to be against the Vedas, which is why even today the Buddhists say they do not accept the Vedas or the Upanishads, Vedic knowledge. Though many of the Hindus do accept the Buddhist teachings. So here the whole discussion is about the fact that through mere logic one can be misled and one needs to have faith in the scriptures. And though the scriptures, you may not understand everything, there is a certain foundation, there is experience behind it, these are the teachings, and with faith you can validate these yourself. But if you start using logic, you are doomed. Now this is what's happening very often to young students, to beginners, because they, they lack the direct experience, they start thinking intellectually and using logic. They, when they try to understand things, it is very difficult and all that happens is they keep arguing and having these intellectual discussions. It leads to nothing. It's a waste of time. But it's, a, it's attractive to some people. They, they, they enjoy these kinds of intellectual discussions. So as this story explained, many of these students followed this person from the teacher of the Shunyavada school or the school of void. But those who did not, they went to their teacher who said, abandon mere logic. Have faith and have direct experience. Any questions about about this so far? Hemachuda continued, Hearing his wise beloved, Hemachuda was even more surprised and finally admitted, Darling, you are so learned. I did not know it before. 
you are blessed and i am blessed because i have your satsang all that is attainable can be attained through firm conviction how do you acquire that where should one place his faith and where not there are numerous scriptures that seem to contradict each other there are even differences among preceptors and commentators about a single scripture also one's own intellectual convictions vary from time to time therefore what should one accept and discard every teacher considers his opinion to be valid and often refutes others opinions claiming them to be unconvincing because of this one cannot reach a definite conclusion even though the scriptures even through scriptures for example the teacher who claimed shunyavad the void to be the supreme reality considered the theories of others to be faulty his statements concur with the scriptures belonging to his own philosophical school so why should we not rely on those statements i believe you have already considered this question therefore sweetheart please help me understand clearly once again some very good questions from hemachuda who said well okay i accept that one should have faith in the scriptures but which scripture should i have faith in because very often the scriptures contradicting each other even teachers from one school of thought contradict each other and even commentaries on a single scripture contradict each other so who to believe and whom not to believe so these are the questions that are asked by all sincere students and it is very true that within traditions also there are teachers who teach different techniques have a different approach their understanding of certain scriptures is different so how is this to be resolved here ends chapter 6 Balaji says the teachings of Buddhism conflicts me because Lord Buddha is a realized master. I don't know if that is a question or is it a comment. Uh, Radhika, my point was uh, how could a realized master uh, give something which is uh, uh, which is not a truth? So that that was my conflict. Hmm. Hmm. Once again it's a question of understanding what Gautam Buddha called shunya is explained by other teachers as satchitanand so it's a description of the same experience and some describe that undescribable experience as shunya or void and others describe it as vibrant dynamic full of truth consciousness and joy the problem actually starts not with the realized master <laughs> explaining it or describing it in a certain way the problem starts with the students or the te- the the followers who then start debating and arguing so gautam buddh most of the time many teachers say we just keep quiet best not to say anything <laughs> so so the teachings of raman maharishi he also said who am i ask this question that was also misunderstood and people start repeating in their minds like parrots who am i who am i this was not meant to be a mantra so the teachings of these masters are misunderstood
and that was a time in India where there were after Gautam Buddha was no longer that they developed many many uh, branches and sub branches within Buddhism itself where they were just spending their time arguing with each other. It split into Mahayana and Hinayana Buddhism and within that also they were lineages etc and that's the same in the Hindu tradition as well. It's everywhere and the reason for that is we understand things the way we understand it through our impure minds that have not been purified through meditation and that is exactly the question of Hematuda. Says whom there are so many teachers and the teachers are conflicting, the scriptures have conflicting claims. How do I understand who is right and who is wrong? So let's see what Himalaya has to say. Chapter 7 is Contemplation and Different Methods of Worship. At the request of her husband, Himalaya, who knew the mystery of the universe, continued explaining, O beloved, compose yourself with reverential attention. I will answer your questions. The mind is like a monkey jumping incessantly. Because of such a mind, people ordinarily get caught in damaging activities. A scattered mind is the cause of pain. The mind in deep sleep is without content and is a cause of pleasant experience. Please listen to me with a one-pointed mind. That which is heard by a disgusted mind is as good as not heard at all, like a tree in a painting that cannot bear fruit. When a person abandons mere logic and begins believing in his own convictions, he gains the desired fruits. Therefore, one should practice sadhana with the help of pure reason. After attaining the faith born of pure reason, person achieves everything here and now. O oh dear, renounce this useless logic. All the activities of this universe are based on shraddha, firm faith. Shraddha alone is helpful. So Himalaya begins by saying that scattered mind causes pain and you should abandon logic. And by logic doesn't mean you become illogical. That's not what is implied here. It means abandon this kind of a useless argumentative logic which is very disruptive. Instead, have faith, believe in your own convictions and you will attain. So practice sadhana with the help of reason, but not just this argumentative logic or this debating approach, which is just a very different kind of approach. It's not based on somebody who really wants to have direct experience. So it says you should practice sadhana. With the determination at the right time, the farmer tills the land. Similarly, discussing, discarding the useless uncertainty of the mind and by having faith, people make decisions regarding the value of silver, gold, gems and medicine. One should be aware of one's ultimate goal, as the scriptures explain. Then make sincere efforts on the path of sadhana. Logic is without foundation. Unlike Shunga, one should not abandon his duty. Effort made with firm faith never fails. How can one miss the goal if he is working with firm faith and making sincere efforts? With faith and effort, farmers grow crops, businessmen earn money, Kings vanquish enemies, intellectuals study, laborers work, the gods drink ambrosia, and meditators realize the absolute. Nothing can be achieved without effort. So we see from these few verses that a farmer tills his land also with some faith. If he would not have faith that the seeds are going to germinate and the fields will be full of grain, he would not till the land. 
if a businessman starts a business but doesn't really have faith that he can earn money out of it then it will never be successful or if a king goes into a battle not believing in himself and in his soldiers how shall he win the battle so in all things we need faith so that we can succeed and so also meditators can realize the absolute with faith need to practice don't just keep arguing logic is without foundation so if you keep on using logic you will go crazy you will just argue read scriptures argue with each, with each other have debates and then what's the result you're going to be lost you will not have any direct knowledge for that you have to have the faith and you have to practice meditation so nothing can be achieved without sincere effort think carefully and tell me has one without faith who does not think reasonably ever attained the desired goal a man who has a skeptical nature and is without conviction can never receive the desired fruits of his action he is his own enemy one must have immense faith supported by right reasoning and sincere effort if he has to select the means for attaining the highest good make use of the means you have there are various methods for attaining the goal whatever you feel to be appropriate consider that to be the way for yourself according to the scriptures and one's own experience one should start practicing sadhana i will tell you these secrets please listen attentively in these few verses basically himalaya says you need to have faith and if you don't you are your own enemy whatever you want to achieve in life it could be something very simple if you want to plan a holiday for yourself it's a simple thing it's no great profound goal you just want to plan a holiday but if you are not really fully interested in going to a certain place you want to go somewhere else and your friend or family or partner wants to go somewhere else then you're not fully dedicated to this you're divided the mind is divided that that does not work it's probably not going to be a very nice holiday finally somebody will make a compromise and if at all you end up going for a holiday it's probably not going to be a good one so this is to be seen in all aspects of our life so says there are many methods for attaining spiritual goals but which one to take you take whichever you find to be appropriate somewhere one has to start so according to your own experience start practicing you have some means i many people ask me this whether it's online here in these meetings or on facebook and i tell those who are not my students who i'm not guiding personally who are asking me just in a sort of a public platform so if you don't have a teacher and if you don't have a systematic approach everyone knows how to pray prayer everybody can do so if you don't know anything else start praying pray for a teacher pray for guidance and it will come so start practicing according to your own experience according to the level you feel you are at and things will come to you so himal lekha says please listen attentively that which removes sorrows should be considered the highest good If one observes subtly, he will find sorrow everywhere in the world. That which is mingled with sorrow cannot be the highest good. It's a very important statement. People ask, 
What is sorrow then? Say, so, yeah, I'm suffering, I have problems, I have difficulties. And sorrow is not just when, you know, when the pain seems to be really intense. But in fact, sorrow is mingled in everything. What we consider to be pleasure, there's also sorrow mingled in it. So anything which has a little bit of taint, is tainted with sorrow, cannot be the highest good. It's mixed, but it cannot be the highest good. Wealth, children, wife, kingdom, treasure, strength, fame, worldly knowledge, intellect, physical beauty are all impermanent. All these objects are deadly, as if located in the mouth of a poisonous snake. Beautiful image. All these objects are very attractive to us. Wealth. Most of us want to have children, want to have a partner. Kingdoms. We may not have these days as many, but treasures, fame. All this is very attractive. And immediately the mind likes the idea. These desires become strong. For this, even knowledge, any form of worldly knowledge, expertise in certain areas, all of us have got some area we, we may be, you know, good at. Many of you have studied, have professions, so you have gathered worldly knowledge. So even this is like an object placed in the mouth of a poisonous snake. Now imagine if you want to get this object, you have to put your hand in the mouth of a poisonous snake. Isn't that a crazy idea? Who would do that? But that's exactly what we do. These are so attractive that we lose our awareness and we try to get these things, these desires. So all these are deadly objects and because of attachment to wealth and all the other objects of the world, there is delusion. Delusion arises out of attachment. Attachment leads to misery. The highest good is not born out of the delusion arising from wealth and other worldly objects. Maheshwara is the cause of the universe. Because of attachment, people are not aware of that. So, we are all suffering from delusions most of the times because we are attached to many of these worldly objects that were mentioned. Uh, whether it was wealth, beauty, intellect, knowledge, as in worldly knowledge, or um, strength, fame, relationships, all these. And the highest good is not born out of this. Attachment is born out of these and attachment leads to misery. So this delusion is, is very, very strong. Advaitic language man also calls it illusion. It's maya. It's this power of maya. It is said that Shankara, Adi Shankara, who was the great teacher of Advaita or non-dualism, also fell into this trap of Maya. And um, that even the wise fall into this trap of Maya at some point of time or the other because it is very alluring, very attractive. And we lose our awareness. Even a magician deludes people through his skill, but his power is limited. He cannot fool everyone. If ordinary people cannot see the illusions conjured by a magician of limited power, then who can cross the mire of delusion created by Maheshwara, the Supreme Lord? One who knows how to be free from illusion gets freedom from it. He can lead a perfectly healthy life and obtain all the joys. 
but that knowledge through which this through which joy is obtained is not possible without grace without the grace of maheshwara how can the maya of delusion be crossed therefore his grace is most essential after being blessed by him and attaining mahavidya supreme knowledge through his grace one can cross the maya of delusion to comment on this this final aspect of of destroying this worldly illusion completely does require grace grace is given many different words or names it is called kripa it is called sambhavi diksha it is called also shakti pat shakti this energy from the divine and pata means that which descends so it comes down as grace it comes down to you normally the effort that you put is going up so you attempt to go up but you always fall down you always fall down you keep trying to go up and all your effort is trying to go go up towards this higher knowledge but sometimes you reach at some point of time you reach there where no one can help you externally and you yourself must surrender and then divine grace comes it can come in different forms it may manifest in a physical form or in any form but it will take you across that final obstacle where this mire of illusion is crossed so if you gain this grace you attain mahavidya that supreme knowledge and you cross this illusion advanced techniques of pranayam and other yogic practices are described in the scriptures as means for attaining supreme knowledge but without the grace of maheshwara they cannot lead to the final goal therefore one should gain the profound knowledge of the absolute this knowledge enables yogic sadhana to remove delusion though one though no one has seen its emergence the universe seems to be the work of someone it is made of parts and some intelligence must be brought it must have brought it into existence the origin of this universe is deep and profound therefore it is a subject to investigation therefore it is subject to investigation with the help of a purified mind and the sayings of the holy scriptures With the help of these one knows that the cause of the universe is not comparable to anything else although some scriptures and philosophers say that this universe came into existence without cause these arguments are invalidated by authoritative scriptures sensory evidence does not lead anywhere it will certainly never lead to liberation and great men do not heed such evidence those scriptures that support such a theory need to be denounced texts that profess mere logic should be discarded because logic alone cannot lead to liberation some philosophers think the universe is without beginning and end this cannot be true because material objects are insentient insentient yet all actions are initiated by a conscious principle without consciousness the can be can be no activity according to most scriptures this conscious principle is the primal cause of the manifestation of the world thus both the scriptures and discrimination reveal that this universe is an effect of the activity of the conscious principle maheshwara he the doer is separate from all worldly objects in these verses himalaya is dealing with certain 
arguments and philosophies which were prevalent not only in those times but even today and the main one is that of the materialists in those days they were called charvaks and now we say materialist these are people who believe in material world this is what they see we see we believe only in what we see that's what the materialists profess they believe in logic and in material objects seeing is believing so many of these people they only believe in the senses they only believe in sensory evidence that's why science uh is almost in opposition to these spiritual traditions because a lot of these spiritual traditions cannot provide evidence to materialists using material science and using objects or instruments of material science any questions so far about this discussion on the material materialists and the material approach to life materialistic approach to life one of the reasons the scripture is so interesting is that it actually goes through all the kind of questions or the doubts that students have that seekers have and provides answers to all of them sometimes in a very entertaining manner as well this is probably a good place to stop in fact i think since he malika goes into further detail now so i think a good place to stop because it continues into still quite long and of course we cannot do that so we can stop here verse 40 and we continue next time all right so goodbye jan bye bye perry thank you for your grace thank you very much perry that you join us every time it's really nice to have you stefani bye bye shibu have a good weekend everyone yeah. bye radhika thank you bye bye manisha yeah So sorry I will speak to you on messenger okay Bye bye everyone